In April 2009, Al-Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition, hosted a lecture by George Galloway, a British Member of Parliament, longtime advocate for the Palestinian cause, and leader of the Viva Palestina aid convoy to Gaza. At the age of 26, Galloway became the youngest ever elected chairman of the Labour Party in Scotland. Galloway became involved in the Palestinian cause in the early 1970s, regularly visiting Lebanon and becoming an activist in support of the PLO. In 1980, he arranged the twinning of his city, Dundee, with the Palestinian town Nablus. Dundee City Hall became the first public building in any Western country to fly the Palestinian flag. In 2003, George Galloway was expelled by Tony Blair from the Labour Party for his opposition to the war on Iraq. In 2004, Galloway founded the anti-war party, Respect, and has been a member of parliament in that party since 2005. The following speech was part of George Galloway's Siege Buster Tour of America. I uh, was really rather overcome by the introduction, not the least of the reasons being that uh, the master of ceremonies reminded you all just how old I am and just how long I've been involved in this Palestine question. And it all started by an act of fate, kiss me. It was the midsummer of 1975. I was 21 years old. I was alone in the Labour Party office in my city of Dundee in Scotland. I had never met an Arab. I had never met a Muslim. Indeed, I had scarcely ever been out of my city before. The doorbell rang in the office. I was alone. I almost didn't answer it, for I had no authority to deal with anyone with a problem who might be knocking on the door. But by that twist of fate, I opened the door, and there was a young man who looked like Omar Sharif, but all Arabs looked like Omar Sharif to me then. He introduced himself as the leader of GUPS, the General Union of Palestinian Students at the nearby university. He said he wanted to come in and talk to the leaders about Palestine. I told them there are no leaders here, but you can talk to me and I will talk to them. He spoke for two hours mesmerizingly about the catastrophe suffered by the Palestinian people, both in the original Nakba and the many disasters which had unfolded ever since. And by the end of that two hours, I was a signed up member of the Palestinian resistance. Mashallah, I remain one to this day. Within two, uh, within two years, I went to Beirut, visited the Palestinian Revolution, then based there. And there in the camps of Sabra and Shatila, I met my friend Ron Mackay, who is with me now, in 1977, 32 years ago, and we're still marching together for Palestine. Many wives have come and gone in that 32 years, but at least we're still together, which tells you something. I don't know what, but it tells you something. And three years after that, as was generously said, we twinned the city of Dundee with the Palestinian city of Nablus, and in 1980, over our city hall, the very first Palestinian flag in the Western world flew, and it's still flying there today, 29, 29 years, years later. later. It was a bitterly controversial thing to do. In those days, I was not so democratic as I am now, though I'm not always perfectly democratic. I decided that on my own 
And in those days, when the left wing was very strong, it was the party which told the council members what to do and not the other way around. So I informed them that we were twinning with Nablus and we were raising this flag and all hell broke loose. I'm sure they cursed me behind my back every day as the Zionist backlash lashed and lashed and lashed the city and its council and its politicians for this brazen act. But we can't be afraid of controversy because with controversy comes interest and with interest comes new support. And that's why I can tell you that in the city of Dundee today, there are more supporters of the Palestinian cause than any other city anywhere in Britain as a result of this controversy. And there are still no Arabs and precious few Muslims. But many years later, after an Israeli raid killed Two Palestinians in Nablus, an old man I didn't know, said to me in the street, I see they killed two of our boys, our boys in Nablus today. So my first message is not to be afraid of controversy, not to be afraid of our opponents, our adversaries, our enemies. They are not James Bonds, you know. There are more Austin Powers than James Bond. <laughs> Believe me, they just have to be opposed and confronted. I have toured the length and breadth of the United States and not a single demonstration or hostile act from the supporters of Israel has been mounted at any of the meetings. This is now my 19th speech on this tour. That's because things have changed. Israel has spent much of the remaining capital it had in the bank of public opinion over those 22 days of atrocity that Zahi was talking about. And it's because we are not afraid and we are ready to face them. Some of you may remember I insisted on appearing in front of the United States Senate in 2005. The senator in charge of the hearing, Norman Coleman of Minnesota, tried to bully me with some procedural matters. Before we started, I said, Senator, don't make the mistake of imagining that I am afraid of you. I am afraid of no one but God. And that's the attitude we have to take, especially now at this turning point in United States political history and in the history of the Middle East. And that will become important when I come to what I hope will be a pleasing finale to what I have to say. I'm very grateful to Omar Offendum for many reasons first time I saw him, confirmed again this evening, as the, is that with his quiet charisma, his lean, good looks, he reminds me of someone. He reminds me of someone. We need people like him in the political system in the United States of America. And I hope you'll support his work and put him on platforms. When he's got music in the background, he's even better. Trust me on that. But I'm grateful to him for raising the subject of Iraq too, which is not separate from this question of Palestine, and which is another war which is still raging, in which a million Arabs have died, and thousands of American and British and other soldiers who were sent by Bush and Blair, the liars, to occupy Iraq on a pack of lies, as I told Senator Norman Coleman. Of course, he's now ex-Senator Norman Coleman. I always get my man. 
I always get my man. Just like the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, I always get my man. Which brings me to Canada. I said I'd made 19 speeches that would have been in 19 different cities. But I couldn't go to Canada because the minority clique, right-wing, neocon, dead-end, last-ditch George Bush government in Ottawa decided to ban me. Because I'm a terrorist, you see. I'm a security risk to Canada. Which will come as a surprise to the Canadian people, amongst whom I've toured and spoken virtually every year for many years, speaking in all their major cities and universities, appearing on their major television and radio shows, giving interviews to their major newspapers. None of them noticed before that I was a terrorist. I was a security risk to Canada. It will come as a surprise to the Homeland Security Division in the United States of America that have allowed me to tour this great land of yours without any kind of restriction. You know, you can be more royal than the king. You can even be more Catholic than the Pope. But to be more anti-terrorist than the United States of America, well, that takes the biscuits. That definitely <laughs> takes the biscuits. Of course, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to behold. And uh, just like the book that's banned is always on the bestsellers list, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand more people listened to what I had to say in Canada because I was banned than ever would have done so if they'd allowed me in. The people who demanded that I should be banned are an organization calling itself the Jewish Defense League, the so-called Jewish Defense League, because they don't speak for any Jews that I know, and there's nothing very defensive about them. They're not even allowed to operate in the United States of America because the FBI declared them to be a terrorist organization. So they relocated to Canada and popped up demanding that I should be banned because I am a terrorist. And the man who led their campaign, a man called Weinstein, if you go to YouTube and look me up on Channel 4 News just before I departed for this tour, you'll see an interview with him in Canada and me in the London studio in which He's very clear that his organization and the Zionist organizations in Canada would ensure that the Canadian government did not back down from this ban. And he openly said on television, sinister if you know anything about that organization, he said that they, they we, he said, would be looking into the peace and church organizations that had invited me to Canada. What the entire Canadian media missed was that this same Weinstein in 1994 appeared on Canadian television once before as the spokesman for an organization called CAH led by the late Rabbi Mir Kahana. And in that interview on Canadian television in 1994, he refused to condemn the murder that day of 50 worshippers in the Ibrahim Mosque in Hebron in occupied Palestine. He refused to condemn it. They missed the fact that on his website, he has a link to an organization called Death. To Arabs. And this is the man making Canadian government policy. These are the people calling other people terrorists, 
and security threats. I say to the Canadian people, it's about time you got your government back. And it's about time Canada stopped being an embassy of Israel in the world. I spoke in the United Nations last week in New York. They obviously didn't know I was a terrorist and a security risk. On the day that I was there in the United Nations building to give my speech, a resolution was passed in the General Assembly condemning, no, not condemning, deploring, less than condemning, the 57% increase in Israeli settlement activity on the West Bank and the demolition of Palestinian houses in East Jerusalem and the proposed new housing units planned by the new Israeli government. 46 countries voted for the resolution. Even the United States abstained. Even Israel didn't turn up to vote against it. Only one country, 46 to 1, only one country voted not to deplore illegal settlement activities. And that country was Canada. So, what was their reason for banning me? Their reason explicitly stated in the government's document was that I had taken an aid convoy to Gaza and gave it to the elected Palestinian government. Now, I'll be candid with you. I'm not myself a supporter of Hamas. I never was, and I'm not now. All my life, and until the last day of his, I was a comrade of President Yasser Arafat. I was there outside the hospital in Paris when he died, if I had a vote in the Palestinian elections, which maybe I do now that I'm an honorary citizen, it would go to the hero prisoner Marwan Barghouti. I'm not a, sir, I'm not a supporter. I'm not a supporter of Hamas, but I am a supporter of democracy. And it's nobody's business who is elected to lead the Palestinian people other than the Palestinian people themselves. It's not up to Washington or London who speaks for the Palestinians. Least of all, it's up to Tel Aviv who speaks for the Palestinians. I myself in my own country have lived through numerous of these foolish and dangerous periods where lists of the banned and the damned are drawn up and declarations that we will never speak to this man or this organization are issued. And years go by and lives are lost and ruined and destruction is wrought before in the end you have to end up speaking to the people you said you'd never speak to. History is littered with them. I was, this shows how long I've been in parliament, 23 years, five times elected. I was there when Mrs. Thatcher, I saw her lips moving. I heard her say that Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. Now no politician in the world wouldn't run across a six-lane highway to get their photograph taken with Nelson Mandela. In the conflict in the north of Ireland, which matters a lot to me, as half an Irishman myself, the British spent years refusing to speak to the people who actually represented those with whom they were fighting. Only, finally, with the help, I may say, of Senator George Mitchell of the United States of America, about whom more later, decided that this farce had gone on long enough, entered the peace process that really was a peace process. The war is over. And the people they'd banned and damned are now sitting in 10 Downing Street. And the last time I looked, they were sitting with President Obama in the Oval Office on St. Patrick's Day. Hallelujah, I say. Hallelujah to that.
It's been done many times. It's the pattern of empire. We had an empire once. When I was young, the maps in our school were really heavily colored pink. Not for any reasons of support for gay liberation, no. Because pink was the color of the British Empire. My teacher said to me when I was seven years old that Britain had an empire so vast that upon it the sun never set. But as my Irish grandfather said, that's because God would never trust the British in the dark. And I never had cause to doubt him. Just to show you how absurd these lists are, these banned organizations are, before I left the United Kingdom three weeks nearly ago, the Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah was a banned organization in Britain. If I'd gone and given a convoy to Said Hassan Nasrallah, I'd have been in the same kind of difficulty in Canada as I am over Palestine. That's just before I left. When I got on the plane, Hezbollah were a banned organization. When I was in the air, the British government announced that they were resuming their dialogue with Hezbollah. And last week, who met them? No less than the Right Honorable Tony Blair. Sat down with Hezbollah that a fortnight before were dangerous terrorists that were on the list of people who couldn't be spoken to. Well, he is the peace envoy, after all. Tony Blair. Yeah? He is the peace envoy. Not since Caligula <laughs> appointed his horse a consul of Rome has there been a more grotesque appointment than Tony Blair as the peace envoy to the Middle East. Of course, Mr. Blair is not a horse. Well, he might be a part of a horse. But that's what happened. I mentioned the empire thing because I'm going to have a few words to say about your own empire. But I don't want you to think that I'm doing so in any kind of superior way. Because I fully understand that I sit and have for almost a quarter of a century in the very building where Mr. Balfour authored the entire Palestinian tragedy. In fact, I pass the room every day. I don't know why I do it. It causes me pain every time I do. I pass the room every day where Mr. Balfour, in an act brazen even by imperialist standards, in his declaration, on behalf of one people, promised a second people the land of a third people. It's pretty brazen. He didn't ask the British people if they wanted to set us off down what Mr. Churchill called this bloody staircase to hell. He didn't ask the Jewish people, the vast majority of whom, when this declaration was made, were not Zionists at all. In fact, were well, the vanguard of leftist and socialist and communist and progressive organizations throughout Europe. And he certainly didn't ask the Palestinian people whose land it was he was giving away. I pass in the same corridor. They're both in the same corridor in the building. If you come to visit me in Parliament, I'll welcome you as I do. All visitors with the words, welcome to the scene of many crimes. In the same corridor is the room in which Mr. Sykes and Mr. Picot, an English and a French official, sat, as Omar Offendam told you, lyrically a few moments ago, with their maps and their pens and divided the Arab world up into the many states of absurdity in which they exist today. They even chose the corrupt kings to 
to sit on thrones. They even invented countries that never existed to find thrones for people who had been rejected on the thrones of other places in the Arab world. And just in case some of the young people think I'm crazy here, let me tell you that just a couple of years ago in Jordan, I met and had lunch with a 94-year-old man in a house on the top of a hill from which you could see Palestine, Lebanon, Syria. I said to him, you're 94, that means you were alive before these countries existed. What did you call yourself when you were young? He was astonished. Hadn't thought of that before. Finally, he answered, we were Arabs from Bilad Sham. They were one country. They were one country before this absurd balkanization of the Arab world created by the British and the French empires in the very corridor that Balfour made his declaration at more or less the same time. And it breaks my heart as someone who has traveled the Arab world more or less from one end to the other many times, many times maybe more than even many of you have done when I see the miserable state of the Arabs today, when I look at this great land mass of the Arab world, from Marrakesh to Bahrain, one people, one language, one culture, one God, all that land, all that sea, all that water, all that oil, all that gas, all that culture, all those people, all that education, the Arabs could be a superpower in the world whom no one could ignore, would be a mighty force intellectually, economically, politically in the world if they had not been broken into so many pieces and if so many traitors in the Arab world hadn't done their best to keep it that way all the decades ever since. <laughs>